Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, remix culture versus copyright infringement. Are the current laws restricting or protecting creative works online? As always, our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here with us monitoring your live online feedback. Tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. Malika, this is an issue that affects so many people in our community. And of course, our community supports the right to remix, but they do have questions about what this means for the creators of content. Venke on Twitter says, how can Creative Commons be made a system that generates creativity while making it possible for creators to survive? So for those of you at home, if you have a question of your own, join the conversation, tweet us with the hashtag AJStream. Yeah, that's one of the many questions we want to answer, and the person who's going to help us do that is Lawrence Lessig. He is an author, activist, proponent of copyright reform, and the co-founder of Creative Commons, a global nonprofit group that provides a legal framework for the sharing and reuse of online works. Currently, Lawrence is a professor at Harvard Law School. Lawrence, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Also contributing to today's show is a special panel of guests who are hanging out with us via Google+. We're going to hear more from all of them in just a few minutes. But if you'd like to take part in a future Google Hangout, follow our news updates on Twitter at AJStream, and you could wind up in the stream. Hi, my name is Hamadun Toure. I'm the Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, and I'm in the stream. Remixes, mashups, and memes have become the language of internet pop culture. But more often than not, people are exercising their creativity in illegal ways by using copyrighted material that they have no claim to. Despite this, remixing and repurposing media is becoming the norm for how online communities share and use traditional media. So what's being done to protect such works from being taken off the web? And conversely, how do artists protect their intellectual property? In 2002, the Creative Commons license was established. It is a public copyright that lets those who create original content give anyone the right to remix, share, and build upon their creations. So in the past decade, how has Creative Commons changed the way we share things on the Internet? They say their ultimate goal is to realize the full potential of sharing communities on the web. So, Larry, I want to start with you. Where do you draw the line between creativity and copyright infringement? Well, the problem is the law itself is completely unclear. Um, in American law, at least, we protect, by the First Amendment, something called fair use, which is the legitimate freedom to take and to transform creative works, subject to a very complicated set of rules and restrictions that define what that freedom is. And what we thought about a decade ago was that that line was too fuzzy for ordinary people that didn't happen to have a lawyer sitting next to them as they were trying to create. So we wanted to supplement or complement that set of freedoms, at least with uh, creative work by authors who wanted to encourage people to build, uh, uh, build upon their work, whether it's scholars or artists or photographers or people who just generally wanted to encourage this internet community of sharing. So we gave away these licenses that try to, in a more clear way, more understandable way, make it clear what you're allowed to do so that we could facilitate legal sharing of creative work and a, and a whole new generation of creativity on top. So it was a way of signaling to people, here's what you can use, here's what you can remix, here's what you can morph into your own creative work with the permission of the creator, him or herself? That's right, because when we started this project, it was as if the world was divided between Hollywood copyright types, the kind of all rights reserved types, and people who didn't seem to want to respect copyright at all, people who thought everything was free for the taking, the artist didn't have any rights to be respected anywhere. So we wanted to present something in between. We thought artists did have rights, they should be respected, but it should be easier for artists to say, look, I'm completely happy if you take my work and share it, use it in education for non-commercial purposes, but if you're Sony and you want to take my picture and put it on your next CD cover, you need to talk to me and get, some, and get my rights first. So it was trying to bridge a gap that was really created by the way the law worked and by the way technology encouraged people to create and share creativity. Andrew Keane, is uh, this working? I don't think it's working in terms of what Larry calls fuzziness. I, I went to the creative, I've never used it, but I went to the Creative Commons site and looked at some of the terms. It seemed very fuzzy. It seemed like you needed to have a law degree. So when Larry talks about something called ordinary people, they might have to hire a lawyer if they want to work with Creative Commons too. You've called the remix culture intellectual fraud. Explain that, if you will. 
I just think it's bogus. All, all, anything creative is by definition remix. So what? A, I just wrote a book called Digital Vertigo, which is quote unquote a remix of Hitchcock's Vertigo. I didn't have to go to Creative Commons to do that. I, I just think that the whole thing is, is a lot of hot air and it doesn't really have any meaning <coughs> in terms of real artists, people trying to make money out of their creative work. Well, people are definitely chiming in here online. John says, copyright was invented to reward innovation, which benefited society. It was not intended to stifle further innovation. Uh, and Professor, there's another one here from Ross who says, being forced to reconsider our place in the world is good for creative prose. Art is a very strange thing to earn a living from. And that's echoed in a video comment here. Have a listen. Hi, Ross Bull here from Arbro from Scotland. Um, far from stifling creativity, uh, the internet, I think, has done a lot to help stimulate the creativity that all human beings have. Um, now, that doesn't always sit too comfortably in societies where we've been taught to commercialise every facet of human existence. Um, I think the culture of the internet, or the sharing culture of the internet, is forcing creative professionals to reconsider our position in the world, and that can only be a good thing. Would you agree with that? Are we changing our mindset on commercializing things? Yeah, I mean, what the, what the internet has done is it's encouraged a whole new class of creators to be able to, to, to create and to share their creativity with a wide range of people. And copyright law was not written for those people. Copyright law was written for commercial uh, creators, commercial artists who needed to earn money for their work. And that's an important part of the creative universe, but the point is the internet's teaching us it's just one part. And there's another part, people who want to create and share for the love of their creativity, not because they're trying to make money from it. Now, you know, Andrew can say that he, he has just gone to the internet, to the Creative Commons website today and found, this, found the terms to be a little bit incomprehensible and call this fraud. I'm a little struck, struck by that because five years ago he wrote a whole article about Creative Commons and he um, attacked it back then. I thought at that point he would have at least taken some time to look at the website. What we're talking about is making it easier relative to copyright law. And copyright law itself is extremely difficult. It certainly was never created for 15-year-olds who are trying to figure out how to create and to share their work. Now, it should be much easier. And I've never said Creative Commons is the end. In fact, we need fundamental reform that helps copyright law do what it was intended to do, make sure that artists get the return that artists need, while also assuring that, cul that culture in, in, in general is able to build upon and share the creativity in the, way, uh, in the way that the internet is now demonstrating is so important. So if there's an artist that's licensed through Creative Commons and then somebody takes that work and builds off of it, is that secondary work then copyrightable? Yeah, so every time you create, copyright is automatic. And as long as what you're producing is original, copyright is automatic. And so Creative Commons doesn't try to change that. What it says is... But what if I build something off of Creative yeah. Commons? So if you take... So my, most of my work is licensed in the simplest license. just says you have to give me attribution. Mm -hmm. So you're free to make what the law calls a derivative on top of my work. So you can take my work and translate it into French. If you translate it into French, that derivative you have a copyright to. And you can decide what you want to do to that derivative. You can say, I got it freely from Lessig. I'm going to make it freely available to others. Or you can say, it's my copyright now. My French right um, to protect this uh, in, the, in the French language is perfectly protected by copyright. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to say to anybody, you need to, uh, you have to, um, at least outside of uh, scholars, where I would say scholars should be in the business of making their work as widely available as they can. But I wouldn't say that to artists or to photographers. It's for them to figure out. We're just trying to give them tools that make it easier for them to experiment with the way that the internet enables this kind of So creativity. artists go into this knowing full well that they're not going to have control necessarily of their work once they, they license it through Creative Commons. Yeah, I think what artists have seen is the internet has taken away their control. Um, and so what they're saying is, well, if the internet's taken away their con my control, is there some way I can engage in a conversation with the, the people who are taking my work to kind of express a fair deal here? So I think many people, the, the most common license we have is basically a non-commercial license that says, share my work, go ahead, build on it. But if you're going to try to profit up from my creative work, then you need to come back and talk to me. Mm -hmm. And many people have found that to be a completely profitable, useful way, even commercial creators for making their work accessible, consistent 
with what they think their purpose in creating is. Well, speaking of the artists, let's speak to one who's in our Google Plus Hangout. Kirby Ferguson is a filmmaker. He's created Everything is a Remix. That's where you might know him from. But Kirby, there's a tweet here from Allison who says, some people are afraid to even post works in the public domain because they're unsure of co how copyright laws work. Are you unsure? And when, when you made your first creation, your first remix, were you unsure? I certainly was, yeah. I mean, I, I felt like it was a bit of a gamble to just put something out there. I mean, I was using uh, existing material, existing music, existing visuals, and, you know, doing a remix, uh, using writing my own material and speaking over it, but using a lot of other people's visuals. So I, you know, created this remix composite sort of thing. I put it out there, and, uh, you know, I found out through actually doing it that, uh, you know, it, it didn't ruffle any feathers particularly. It went over just fine. Larry, you've spoken numerous times on the threat of copyright law to internet creativity. How do you think things have changed because of Creative Commons in the last 10 years? Well, you know, there's been an extraordinary explosion of creativity that we wouldn't pretend to claim ownership of, right? There's, this has happened in all sorts of ways nobody ever predicted. Um, but what we've tried to do is to, is to provide a platform that sustains it and encourages it. So uh, in the context of, for example, mashup and remix music, um, there's whole communities of artists who license their work in CC so that there's a library of material that people can take and remix without worrying about the incredibly complicated uh, rights clearances that would be necessary if they did it in the old-fashioned way. We've been very happy and proud to, to be part of that. In the context of academic publishing, the, the vast majority of journals now are pushing towards a kind of what's called open access way of making their work available. And by far, our licenses are the overwhelming default in that context too. Wikipedia has embraced the Creative Commons license as the way to assure that all of its creative work is permanently uh, accessible freely by others because it's subject to a license that says that if you take and build on this work, you have to release your work in a similarly free way. So, uh, and Al Jazeera has taken I was huge, just about to yeah, say that. Has hu taken huge chunks of video from uh, Palestine and made this accessible in a way that allows documentary filmmakers and other news stations around the world to, to have access to a kind of information that of course is extremely expensive for them to be able to do. So these are all people who are not sort of saying, I want to give up making money. Obviously, Al Jazeera is a business. They're trying to make money. But consistent with their business model, they realize they don't need to claim all of these rights. And so that's the only job we're trying to do, to give them an easy way to say, here's the work that you can make accessible. Well, Andrew, uh, in our Google Plus Hangout, I'd like to go back to you. Of course, you're the author of The Cult of the Amateur, and you've uh, been on the stream before. I want to go back to this tweet that we read at the top of the show from Venke, who says, how can Creative Commons be made a system that generates creativity while making it possible for creators to survive? Is this your same issue, that creators can't survive in, in a system like this? Well, in fairness to Larry, I mean, I, I don't think his remit has ever been to provide revenue for creative people. He's in another business. Uh, but I do think that he's coming at this in a very different way to most creators. He's a professor, he's paid uh, a wage, and he doesn't need to be paid for his creative work. So it's very easy for him to give his stuff away, just as other people who are lucky enough to have those kind of jobs. But for creators, I would like to see Creative Commons really focus on how to generate revenue for people like myself, because I agree with Larry. The internet is a, a remarkably creative, fertile, uh, platform for, for the artists of the 21st century, but I don't see very much evidence at Creative Commons that he's really taking that into account. He mentions Wikipedia. To me, Wikipedia is a scam in the sense that they don't pay their contributors. Um, so I would like to see uh, much more focus from Larry and his community on how to financially reward artists. It's all very well for the guy at the beginning on the Google Plus chat to say, well, we value commercial stuff too much. But I got, you know, I got, I, I've got to feed my kids. I've got to pay my rent. How else am I going to do it if I give my stuff away for free? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, we wouldn't say that our job is to solve all of copyright's problems. But we have seen a lot of interesting innovation in what we think of as this hybrid market. So if, if you go to Flickr, which is a photo sharing site, from the very beginning they have embedded CC licenses inside their architecture. Uh, and then Getty Images has now partnered with Flickr. So you can, you can take your Flickr images and you can license them CC non-commercial, which means people can use them for non-commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. But there's a simple click-through from that to go to Getty Images to be able to license the image for commercial purposes. So there's a way to allow creative work to live both in this 
amateur market. I celebrate the concept of amateur, not and uh, different from Andrew's criticism of the concept of amateur, but I celebrate that market. I think people are free and they should be encouraged to uh, contribute to it. But I also think we have to find a way for the people in that market to cross over and to be able to be compensated where it's appropriate to be compensated. And we uh, are seeing many more experiments like that. And we are happy to see that kind of experiment because we do think we've got to find a way to, uh, to, to reward a wider range of creators. But the important thing to recognize is the millions of people who are creating right now in YouTube, for mm -hmm. example, they are completely happy for the freedom to be able to create and share their work um, with the same kind of luxury that I have because they don't actually need to be making and creating. And so what we're saying for the making money from their crea creativity, so what we're saying to them is, okay, here's a simple way to frame and to embed your creativity in legal infrastructure to protect it in the way you want to protect it. So YouTube has embedded Creative Commons licenses inside of their architecture to achieve exactly that objective. Is there a degree of confusion that's happening here, though, between these people who are creative sorts and they want to freely give out their creations online and use other people's, maybe they're not dependent on making a living off of it, so they think a little attribution or, oh, fair use, that sounds like I can use this, you know, for the greater good, whatever I deem that to be. Kind of like what you were talking at the beginning, there are all these gray areas, yeah. and it just, it's so unclear for folks. I mean, Malik and I were looking at the tweets earlier, people saying, what's Creative Commons, mm -hmm. what's fair use? People don't even though they use the net a lot, they don't really understand these things. You know, terms. that's right. And this, you know, ultimately my view is legislators have got to clear up copyright's mess. Copyright was written for an analog age, completely set of different set of technologies. And we've got to update it to make it make sense in the digital technology. We're just trying to do a kind of hack on top of it to make mm -hmm. it easier, to make it function better. Um, but what we're trying to do is to make it easier for a wider range of these people to to be able to create with confidence, and, and we certainly have done that, and it's not just the amateur. Greg Gillis, uh, who's uh, Girl Talk, a uh, very, very important remix artist, um, uh, expresses this ethic by believing he has a fair use right to be remixing the work that he's remixing, but then he makes his creative remixes accessible under a Creative Commons license. Now, he's a successful musician, commercial musician. But does musician. he have under the actual technical definition of the law, does he have a fair use right to be using this material? Oh, I think he plainly does, which is why he's never, you know, actually been sued, even though people have raid all, raised all sorts of questions. So I think he does have a fair use right. Mm -hmm. And if he does have a fair use right, he's allowed to make money off of the, uh, of the creativity he produces. But what he's saying is, I still believe there's an ethic here I need to respect. And the ethic is, I'll take my remixes and I'll make them accessible to others more clearly, more freely, because I've embedded them in a Creative Commons license. Well, broadening this out a bit, I want to go back to our Google Plus Hangout uh, to speak to Teresa. Teresa Nobre is a Creative Commons member in Portugal. And Teresa, I wonder if there are challenges to implementing this globally. There's a tweet here from Donatella, also a Creative Commons member, who says, Creative Commons is not only a threat to copyright, it seems that regimes are also scared by openness and sharing, and she uh, includes the hashtag free Basel, which of course uh, refers to Creative Commons member Basel Safadi uh, in a jail in Syria. Neslihan on Twitter also says, CC licensing could face certain resistance from nations wanting to control and regulate what we see as entertainment. Teresa, care to respond? Yeah, thank you. Um, so. Just one point before, because Creative Commons is all about also uh, educating people uh, about copyright. Because uh, Lawrence Lessig was saying that uh, in uh, United States you have fair use, but in most of the countries in the world we don't have fair use or any kind of flexible um, clause uh, towards uh, copyright. So, uh, for instance, in Portugal or in and in many other countries in the world, you cannot use uh, words uh, for education uh, uses, uh, copyright words for education uses, or uh, disabled people don't have access to copyrighted words because the law doesn't provide for such type of exceptions and limitations to a copyright. So, um, uh, in, in the end, the aim of, of uh, Creative Commons is, uh, is really to, to foster uh, um, copyright reforms and, and to allow for more flexibility and Creative Commons tools allow uh, in that way, uh, but in the end we will always need copyright reforms. So, and in these countries where where uh, uh, where you have regimes that uh, um, 
not threatening your your freedom of expression, I think Creative Commons makes uh, even more sense. And Okay. Uh, Larry, you know, we talk about this mostly in the realm of artistic and creative pursuits, but talk about its application with government and with science and education. Yeah, this has been part of the hardest thing for me about this whole movement. When we started this, we knew we were going to have fights, some playful flight, fights like the kinds Andrew and I have had for many, many years. But it, you know, it, the worst that you were going to do was be yelled at by an RAAA lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, but in certain parts of the world, this is a life or death issue. So, so Basel has been in jail in, in, in Syria now for nine months because of his activism uh, for free software and also free culture. Um, because, of course, the Syrian regime views this as a threat to their internal security. Um, and our fear is that he's actually going to be brought up for court martial uh, within the next couple of weeks. Now, um, this makes this issue much more uh, poignant and powerful, I think, when people begin to recognize that this is not just about the ability of people to be doing clever remixes that get viral on YouTube, but it's also about people having the ability to spread and share and build upon their culture. So when they take CC licensed images from Al, Al Jazeera and they add commentary on it, commentary that might be critical of their own regime, that is an opportunity to teach people building upon these resources, which obviously regimes that are criticized uh, don't like, and, and, and that's, that's exactly what's at stake with Basel. And what about in more traditional uses for academics? Well, uh, academics, um, you know, in America are, I think, oblivious to the way in which uh, the traditional publishing system for academic journals makes the academic work completely inaccessible in 98% of the rest of the world. Um, you know, I, I once did this demonstration about how in the area that I'm working on right now, uh, c uh, corruption, 90% uh, of the articles were completely inaccessible unless you happened to be inside of a rich American university where they were free, but for the rest of the world they were completely uh, unavailable. And that's because, you know, these businesses build their model assuming that they're targeting the rich universities in Western Europe and in, and in America, not really thinking that maybe the information in these journals is valuable to Africa or valuable in different parts of Asia. So the uh, open access movement, which the Public Library of Science has been championing, but many others, uh, which says we're going to make sure that all of this scientific work is freely accessible everywhere in the world, um, has been incredibly important in making sure that other scientists from around the world and other academics can join a conversation which the privileged elite in the West have been uh, participating in for a long time. All right, we're going to put this conversation on hold with Lawrence Lessig and uh, continue it in our online post show. So if you're not already there, log on to stream.aljazeera.com. And before we continue, Malika's got a few other stories we're following. As Creative Commons celebrates its 10th birthday, members are calling for one of its volunteers to be freed from a Syrian jail. Using the hashtag Free Basel, supporters say Palestinian Syrian software engineer Basel Kartabil has been detained since March by President Assad's forces. Just recently, Basel was reportedly transferred to a military prison where Twitter users like Mohammed note, no laws are followed, no right to have a lawyer, no family are allowed to attend. Advocates are using Facebook and Instagram to raise awareness, and at least one influencer supporter on Twitter, Nasser Widadi, has called for a day-long fast in solidarity. Our next leads from the U.S., where the National Rifle Association has removed its Facebook page from public view. That move follows Friday's fatal shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. The shutdown comes after the gun lobby received online criticism for updates like this, without any words for the shooting victims. NRA's Twitter feed has also remained inactive since Thursday, raising further compl complaints. Many argue for NRA on social media, but the NRA doesn't support them at all, Murdoch tweets. Other groups are not remaining as silent. The controversial U.S. Westboro Baptist Church, known for picketing events they believe are caused by homosexuality, promised to bring their protests to Newtown. Hacking collective Anonymous took notice. The group hacked the Twitter account of Westboro's spokeswoman, Shirley Phelps Roper. The account now features tweets like this one, praising the hack. Dropping my daughter off at school this morning was difficult, but seeing that dear Shirley had been hacked made me smile. Well, tweet us your thoughts in those stories using hashtag AJStream. Lisa? And join us for the post show at stream.aljazeera.com.
Welcome to the Streams Online Post Show. Our guest in studio today, Lawrence Lessig, Harvard University professor and co-founder of Creative Commons. Uh, I want to pick up the conversation with Andrew Keene, who has been critical of Creative Commons. Um, Andrew, why don't you jump in? I know you, want to, you wanted to get in at the end of the main show. Yeah, um, you know, Larry talked about fuzziness. I have to admit, after this show, I'm even, I think his definition of Creative Commons is even fuzzier. Is it something for artists? Is it a political tool for people critical of their own regime? Is it something for something called girl talk? It's not entirely clear to me what it is. I, I do want to take him up on one point, though. He, he talks about this idea of being critical of their own regime, and I'm and I, I sympathetic to that, in principle, at least. But I'm not sure how it works. Um, you know, I'm kind of surprised in a way that Al Jazeera has the confidence to give their stuff to Creative Commons. A few years ago, uh, Larry put out a, uh, a remixed video on, uh, on YouTube satirizing Christianity using the background music of Gloria Gaynor, who happens to be a Christian. What I want to know, and I, have, I was amused by Larry's thing, I thought it was very funny, it was, I much prefer that to some of his legal writings, but what I want to know is what where are the guarantees? Where's the protection so that someone doesn't use an Al Jazeera clip to, to talk about, you know, wiping out Muslims or Jews or Christians? It doesn't seem clear to me how this thing works. Lawrence? So I, I, I can see you're not understanding. It's very unclear to you. And it's been unclear for a while, Andrew. Um, and uh, we've had a long exchange. If you go to bit.ly, bit.ly slash Lessig on Keen, you can, you can get a little bad background on it. But let me try to let me try to address a little bit of the uh, of the unclarity. People use create for lots of different reasons. All Creative Commons licenses try to do is to give them an ability to license their creative work freely, regardless of their purpose. So it might be to criticize the government. It might be to entertain their friends. It might be for a project that they have in their high school. It doesn't matter what the purpose is. This is just but a way of making the licenses, uh, making the copyrights more clearly and easily understood. Now, in the context of uh, fair use, it's not Creative Commons that was giving me the right to display in the context of a talk about copyright somebody else's remix of creative work to explain the way fair use works. This is a freedom given to me, at least in America, it's different in Britain, um, by the Constitution. So I exercise my free right under the Constitution to criticize or to explain or to educate or to transform. All of that has nothing to do with Creative Commons. All Creative Commons does is to say, if you want to make it easier, clearer, no less, uh, uh, not changing the underlying freedoms granted by the Constitution, but you want to make it easier for people to build in your work, then you can CC license your work. So Gloria Gaynor certainly has not CC licensed her work, and I didn't build on her work because of anything to do with Creative Commons. Well, Kirby, I want you to chime in here. Uh, there's a sentiment that's being echoed by a couple of people in our community. Rehan on Twitter says, Creative Commons, uh, every idea is an extension of someone else's idea, one way or the other. But then, of course, he is then uh, countered by uh, one person who says these remixes or uh, compilations have encouraged a, lab a level of laziness. There's no struggle anymore. I mean, I certainly think, I think both things can be true, you know. Uh, it can be lazy to just kind of, you know, throw clips together and put some music over it or whatever and, you know, just do something that's, you know, didn't take a lot of effort, doesn't really have much insight. But I do think sampling is a legitimate way to express yourself. I think using you know existing media, existing video, existing audio, merging those together and recontextualizing them is really compelling. It's really interesting. And I think, unfortunately, we've mostly cut that form of expression off. And I'd like to see that valve, you know, reopened through, it, uh, you know, through, through revisions to the actual copyright code. Well, Kirby, I also want you to elaborate on what you mean by everything is a remix, because that speaks right. to this first tweet that says every idea is an extension of someone else's idea. It's pretty similar to what Andrew said uh, at the start of the show, actually, that, you know, any kind of creativity involves remixing work that is already out there. So copying things. Uh, transforming them, combining them, those are just kind of the ABCs of any sort of creativity. All you can really do is work with these materials that are already out there and build on work that other people have already done. But w couldn't some people argue that sampling is a nice way of saying stealing? Well, there is sure. Sure, certainly is some sampling that crosses the line into stealing. But I think Kirby's point is a, is a really good one. Andrew made uh, point is a really good one. You know, because if you think about the way in which writers create, mm -hmm. you know, when I write an, uh, an article, I take quotes 
I incorporate, the, incorporate them into my article. Of course, I give attribution, but I build by taking other people's work and mixing it together in a way that expresses the ideas I want to express. When we started this work, though, um, what we saw is that in certain other areas of creativity, for example, filmmaking, the standard view in Hollywood was you are not permitted to use one second of a person's film without clearing the rights up front. And so what we said is, what's the difference between taking Hemingway and including it in an, an article about you know, writers in the 20th century and taking a clip from Alfred Hitchcock and using it in a film about the 20th century? In theory, there should be no difference between it. But the practices had developed in such a disparate way that when something like YouTube came along, it was guaranteed there was just going to be a fight. Now, some companies have been great in this fight. For example, Viacom. Um, Viacom, of course, is very vigilant in fighting when people take uh, whole copies of Jon Stewart or, um, or Colbert and put it up on the internet without uh, any permission from Viacom. They will be bulldogs and get that taken down right away. But if you remix that work, if you do some creative commentary, if you take them and make fun of Colbert or Colbert, uh, make fun of, uh, of uh, Jon Stewart, they won't touch it. Their view is remix is creativity and we're not out there to stop that kind of creativity. And that's the kind of evolution I think we've seen in the last decade, which encourages me because I think both sides are beginning to recognize that it is really valuable when you have 20 million, 30 million people in the United States engaging in creative uh, expression rather than just sitting back passively and consuming stuff that's being produced by others. And some of them are sharing their creative expressions, but that's, this is a video comment left by one member of our community. Have a listen to this. Hi, I'm Exiled Surfer, currently in Vienna. Ten years, Creative Commons. I've been a copy leftist myself for uh, ten years, and it's a really easy way for me to let people know right up front that they can use my work and repurpose it, remix it, and pass it on so that it's part of the contemporary dialogue. Um, it's a lot worse to be irrelevant than it is to be poor, to quote Cory Doctorow. <laughs> so he calls himself a copy leftist and says he'd rather be poor than irrelevant. Is some of this about relevance? Yeah, a lot of it is in the internet age, you know, when you see the whole business model has shifted to how do we get people to pay attention. Um, people are in the business of making money. That's the way they've shifted it. It's, it's made it much more obvious that the idea of authorizing and encouraging people to take and build upon your work is consistent with the ability of people to make money in this age. So that's great for people who want to make money in this age. But I'm also uh, encouraged and, 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 and concerned that you know, kids who want to be able to express themselves should be able to do it without the principles that their high school is telling them that if they do this, they will be punished because they violated the copyright norms of, of the school. So you're not arguing that ideas are not property. You're just saying people who come up with the ideas should have the right to freely share them. Yeah, the authors of creative work, I think, um, you know, are in America already have some of their uh, uh, control taken away by fair use. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, they should be free to decide what additional freedoms they want to give away. So a Creative Commons license simply says, here are the freedoms that I want to give to the public, as opposed to all rights reserved. This is some rights reserved. Some rights I'll keep, some rights I'll give to the public. And I make it clear and easy, as, as the commentator from Vienna says, right up front. Now, I don't know how people, why people should oppose this. And indeed, when we launched this project 10 years ago yesterday, mm. um, I kind of surprised the uh, audience because we had a video from John Perry Barlow famous copyright anarchist who said, well, in a world of injustice, Creative Commons is the, is the best compromise we could have. And then that segued directly into a video by Jack Valenti, who then was the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, who said, this is a perfectly fine project. If artists want to give away their work, then copyright law says they ought to be free to do that. And this is an infrastructure for doing it. And Jack Valenti says, I hope I don't destroy your project, Larry, by, by endorsing it here. So uh, he didn't do too much harm to it. And, uh, and I think that's what eventually people are coming around to recognize the balance is. Lawrence Lessig, thank you so much for joining thanks us for today. Thanks for having me. Kirby, Andrew, Teresa, thanks for being with us in the Google Hangout. Now our next show is the Dutch tradition of Black Pete featuring Santa's elves with blackface, a cultural treasure, or racism? Tweet us your questions and your comments about that. And until then, we'll see you online.